Hello friends and welcome to our Bible study entitled Understanding Daniel. Coming to you from Granite Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church in Sacramento, California. We'd like to welcome those who are joining us online across the country and around the world. We'd also like to welcome those who are here in person at the Granite Bay Church. I know we have some visitors. We kind of chatted a little before we started the program from uh, all over the place, as far away as Jamaica. So we want to welcome those who are here in person. Uh, if you're new to our Sabbath school, we've been studying through the book of Daniel. We've been going verse by verse through the entire book. Today we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 4, and that's going to be the place where we're going to be starting, Daniel chapter 4. I'll be putting some notes up on the screen, but before we get to our study, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we are so grateful for the many blessings that you have given us. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather together and study your word. Father, this is an exciting and interesting chapter as we look at the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar, a very powerful story of what your grace can do in the heart of somebody who is surrendered to you. So we pray for your spirit to come and guide us, lead us into a clear and full understanding of what it is that is revealed to us here in Scripture. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Daniel chapter 4. The main focus for Daniel chapter 4 is the story of the conversion of the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was king of Babylon. Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar built a very uh, strong friendship during the time that he was there. Even though Daniel was a captive in Babylon, he earned the trust of the king, and you'll see how influential Daniel is in Nebuchadnezzar's life. But before we get to the actual chapter itself, let's just do a quick review, a little history of the history of Nebuchadnezzar, a little overview of the history of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar's father was somebody by the name of Nabopolassar. Nabopolassar was a, uh, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, was an Assyrian general during the time when Assyria was still the dominant power. Around 625 BC, he was sent to subdue an uprising in Babylon. As a reward for his success, he was made ruler of Babylon. He was given the title King of Babylon. But then in 612 BC, Nabopolassar joined Media and Egypt in revolt against Assyria dividing the Assyrian Empire into three divisions. Media was ruled in the, to, uh, to the north and the northeast. Babylon ruled on the plains of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Egypt ruled in the land of the west of the Euphrates and in North Africa. So the territory once occupied by Assyria was divided up into three divisions. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, who was now king of Babylon, he wasn't content just to remain king of Babylon. He had broader ambitions. Uh, after the division of the Assyrian Empire, uh, Babylon's growing ambition for greater power soon led to war with Egypt. Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, led a large army against Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar sent his son Nebuchadnezzar with an army, with the army of Babylon, out to meet him in battle. The battle occurred in a place called Carchemish, and we'll see on a map in just a minute, one of the Hittite capitals on the bank of the Euphrates River. In this battle, the Babylonians, under Nebuchadnezzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's son, it was victorious. Uh, pursuing the Egyptians through Palestine towards Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar conquered it as he went. During this military campaign, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, and the events recorded in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 occurred. You can also read about that in 2 Kings 24, verse 1. Now, the historian Barossus, whom Josephus quotes, relates that after Nebuchadnezzar had completed his military campaign against Egypt, but still being in the west, he received word of his father's death back in Babylon. Leaving the captives among the Jews, among whom Jews are mentioned, in the hands of his general, he hurried back to Babylon by the short desert route as quickly as possible to secure the throne of the kingdom. So here we have a map, and you can see this map. Over here on the eastern side, of course, you've got Babylon. And over on the other side, you've got Jerusalem. And so you have the Egyptian army under Pharaoh Necho moving his army up this way. And you have the Babylonians moving their army up towards the north, and they met in Carchemish. You can see the name of the city. Of course, if you were to travel from Babylon over here in the east towards Jerusalem, you didn't usually go this route. This was through the desert. So they'd usually follow up the Euphrates River, and then they'd come down from the north if they were journeying towards Jerusalem. So after the victory that Nebuchadnezzar had over the Egyptians here in Carchemish, he began to make his way down, conquering as he went, and that's when he surrounded Jerusalem. Jerusalem in 605 fell to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies. No sooner had Jerusalem fallen when he received word of his father, Nabopolassar, who had died back in Babylon. And so leaving captives with his generals here in Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar hurried across the shorter desert route as quickly as possible to secure the throne of the kingdom. 
Now, here is a stone uh, relief. Uh, it's sort of about, discovered about 100 years ago, late 1800s, somewhere in there, early 1900s, in ancient Babylon, the ancient site of Babylon. And it's interesting because here you can see made out a little bit the form of what looks like a man. He's got his hand raised up, and we'll look more at the details there. This is actually a depiction of Nebuchadnezzar. This is outside of the Bible, and here, if you look on this side, you can see how they've kind of drawn what's on the stone. This is an actual representation of the king we're reading about today. Here you can see him wearing the royal robe. He's got some sort of a staff in his hand. You can see that. And then in his uh, right hand, he's holding what looks to be a little bit of a scroll. And it's believed that the scroll probably contained the building plans of the ziggurat that he's actually looking at. Now over here, if you look back on the stone side, you can see a pyramid that's got steps kind of going up on either side. And over here in the drawing area, you can see what it is. This is a ziggurat, or this is where the temple Marduk was built, right on the top. The top of that was the temple Marduk. It's interesting if you count the number. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six platforms, and then on top of the six is the temple itself. Of course, six was a very significant number to the Babylonians. Their whole system of reckoning and counting was based on the number six. Revelation talks about the beast power with the number of 666. It also ties that in with Babylon. So there's all kind of prophetic connections that we have. So what the stone depicts is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was overseeing the construction of this temple to Marduk. It was one of the biggest structures in ancient Babylon, right on the top of this pyramid-like structure. To the, north, to the top of that, right above it, you can see the floor plans that was carved into the stone, and that is actually the floor plans of the temple on the top of the ziggurat that was made out to Marduk. And there's some writing down below that kind of describes what this is all about. So there is an archaeological uh, find. There is some evidence outside of the Bible that talks about this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So not only do we read that in the Bible, we actually have archaeological evidence. So here's an artist's rendition of what Babylon probably looked like. It was a beautiful city. Nebuchadnezzar was a great builder. And the building that we just saw earlier recorded on that stone is this building right here. And right on the top was the temple to the god Marduk. And that comes up as we see our story, as we read through Daniel chapter 4. All right, well, with that as the background, let's get right to the passage itself. Daniel chapter 4, and we're going to start reading here in verse 1. It begins by saying, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all people, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Now, right off, just by reading this opening statement, it's Nebuchadnezzar that's speaking. He is the king, and he's writing to all people and nations and languages. That's everybody under his domain and power. And Nebuchadnezzar had a title of king of the world, as did also some of the Persian rulers. Uh, they wanted to be rulers of the world, at least the then known world, everything that they knew to be the world. And so yeah, Nebuchadnezzar is writing to the people under his domain, and he says, peace be multiplied unto you. Now, that's interesting. Rarely will you speak or find a pagan king uh, uh, greeting his, his subjects by saying, peace be multiplied unto you. Usually the kings wanted to make sure that they had full control over their people. They wanted them to know who was the boss. But here Nebuchadnezzar, the Spirit of God is working upon his heart, and he says, peace be multiplied unto you. So Daniel chapter 4 is one of the most powerful testimonies of conversion that we find in the Bible. It contains the public declaration of Nebuchadnezzar, who was king of Babylon, recounting his experience that led him to acknowledge the God of the Hebrews as the true God in heaven who rules over the kingdoms of men and gives it to him whomever he chooses. Verse 2 says, I thought it good to declare the signs and the wonders that the most high God has worked for me. Although Nebuchadnezzar had seen the power of the Hebrew God in the interpretation of the dream in Daniel chapter 2 and the deliverance through the fiery furnace of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his heart remained proud and self-reliant. It was not until God removed him from his throne and humbled him before his people that he finally recognized his sinfulness and looked in faith to the God of heaven for salvation. So notice the two things that's mentioned before this. Nebuchadnezzar, he's ruling in Babylon. He has a dream recorded in Daniel chapter 2. His wise men are unable to interpret the dream. Daniel comes in. He gives the dream to the king as well as interpretation. And he talks about the God of heaven who will establish a kingdom, the stone cut out without hands that comes and strikes the image upon its feet. 
And then the stone grows and becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. That's the God of heaven. So Nebuchadnezzar, already back in Daniel chapter 2, this is just a couple of years into the Babylonian captivity, he knows about this God of heaven that would set up a kingdom that would last forever. Well, in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar, not wanting his kingdom to end, built a giant image made of what material? Gold. And of course, in Daniel chapter 2, the head of the image was made of gold, which represented Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. He made the entire image out of gold, saying, my kingdom will never come to an end. In defiance of the God of heaven, the most high God, and then, of course, you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how that God delivered them from the fiery furnace. And once again, Nebuchadnezzar had to acknowledge that there is no God like the Hebrew God, like God Most High. But still, his heart was proud, and God was still working on him. And that's why we find this story recorded for us here in Daniel chapter 2. Now, Daniel chapter, or rather Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 is divided up into five sections, and you can see them there. First of all, from verse 1 to verse 9, is Nebuchadnezzar the king himself making this declaration to the people in his kingdom. And then from verse 10 to verse 18, you have Nebuchadnezzar's second dream that involves a great tree that is cut down. And then you have Daniel interpreting the dream and giving advice to the king. And then we find the king going through the experience that was foretold in the dream, his humiliation where he was uh, insane for seven years and then at the end of that, Nebuchadnezzar's conversion and his restoration as king over Babylon. So those are the five divisions of the chapter. All right, looking at verse 3, he says, How great are his signs, this is the signs of the Most High God, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. So Nebuchadnezzar gave his testimony with a genuine spirit of repentance. This is after he went through the experience described. He freely acknowledges his sin and spoke of the marvelous working of God for his salvation. Now we, like Nebuchadnezzar, should be ready to tell others of what God has done for us. Amen? Amen. We are to be witnesses. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him, that's the dragon or Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. Acts chapter 22, verse 15 says, For you will be his witnesses to all men of what you have seen and what you have heard. Nebuchadnezzar was indeed a true witness. He told people of what had happened to him, what he had seen, what he had heard, what the God of heaven had done for him. And likewise, we are to be God's witnesses. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, and I was flourishing in my palace. Having conquered the kingdoms within his reach, Nebuchadnezzar achieved the pinnacle of earthly power and was finally at rest in his palace in Babylon. Success had followed him wherever he went. Into his coffers flowed the wealth of the east and the west, the north and the south. The city of Babylon became known as what's called the Golden City, one of the wonders of the ancient world. The king was flourishing in his palace, like the fool in the rich, the foolish rich man in the parable, whose fields had produced abundantly, he forgot his responsibility to the one to whom he owed his greatness. Now, of course, not only was Babylon a very wealthy city, a lot of gold was used in decorating the different things of the city. But it was also famous for the famous hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the ancient wonders of the world. So Nebuchadnezzar was a great builder, and um, he looked at the things that he had made, filled his heart with even more pride. Now Jesus told a parable recorded for us here in Luke chapter 12, verse 16. You've probably heard this before, but let me remind you of what Jesus said. Jesus said, then he spoke this parable, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? He said, this I will do. I will pull down my barns and I'll build greater barns. And there I'll store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will all those things be which you have provided? Then Jesus finished up the parable with these words. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Well, Nebuchadnezzar fits that mold perfectly. He had laid up great treasure and he said to himself, relax, be at ease, enjoy the works of your hand but he was not rich towards God, and judgment came. Verse 5, Nebuchadnezzar says, I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts of my bed and the visions of my head 
troubled me. Now this is the second significant dream that we read about Nebuchadnezzar having. The first dream, of course, Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar saw a giant image made of various metals. The head of the image was made of gold, which represented what kingdom? The Babylonian kingdom. Chest and arms of silver represented what kingdom? Medo-Persia. The belly and the thighs of brass represented the kingdom of? Greece. And then the legs of iron represented what kingdom? What kingdom conquered the Grecians? Rome. Then the feet in Daniel chapter 2 was made up of two different metals, kind of mixed together. Do you remember what they were? Clay and iron mixed together. Now, how does clay and iron mix? Well, they don't really mix. How are they used? Well, they used clay to make molds into which they would pour the molten iron. Then they'd break off the clay. So you have the clay shaping the iron. Now, of course, the feet of iron and clay represent Western Europe as we have it today. Some nations are strong, some are weak. But even in a broader sense, in a prophetic sense, it describes Europe during the time of the papacy when the church was molding or shaping what the kingdoms of Europe would do, like the iron and the clay, the clay that molds the iron. We see the same thing during the 1260 years of papal supremacy taking place in Europe. But then in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar sees a stone that is cut out without hands. Now why is the stone cut out without hands? Because the kingdom symbolized by the stone is not an earthly kingdom. It's not a man-made kingdom. It's a kingdom that comes from the sky, strikes the image upon its feet, grinds all of the various metals to powder, the wind blows it away, and the stone grows and becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. What does that mountain represent? What does the stone represent? It represents the establishment of Christ's kingdom, right? Second coming of Christ, and then the earth made new at the end of the 1,000 years. So that was a significant dream, very important dream. It troubled Nebuchadnezzar. And when he called his wise men to give him the interpretation, they couldn't at first, they couldn't tell him the dream nor the interpretation. But then Daniel came and explained the various metals, but he made it clear that the God of heaven has made known unto you a king what shall be hereafter. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like the idea of his kingdom coming to an end. That's why you have the image of Daniel chapter 3. And yet God in his patience is once again giving another dream to Nebuchadnezzar to try and reach this king's heart, to recognize that The God of heaven is the one that rules in the kingdoms of men, not Nebuchadnezzar, not earthly kings. All right, because Nebuchadnezzar did not continue to walk in the light that he had received from his first dream, recording Daniel chapter 2, God in his mercy gave the king another dream to warn him of the danger of claiming for himself the glory that alone belonged to God. The date for this dream has been placed around 568 BC after Nebuchadnezzar had been king for about 35 years. Now Nebuchadnezzar had a very long and prosperous reign. Uh, He ruled for a little over 40 years. He died around the age of 80 is what people say. So he was a very long-lived king. He had lots of time, lots of power to rule, and God was working on him. Verse 6, therefore I issued a decree to bring all of the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. So this is a repeat of Daniel 2. He has the dream calls of the wise men to come in. Daniel chapter 2, the wise men were powerless to tell the king what his dream meant. And we find the same thing occurring now in Daniel chapter 4. Greatly troubled by the dream, which was a seeming forecast, seemingly a forecast of calamity, uh, the king once more called for his wise men. It says, then the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers came in and I told them the dream, but they did not make known unto me its interpretation. Now you see four groups mentioned there. The magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The magicians, they claim to have contact with the spirit of the gods. They could foretell the future. The astrologers would look to the stars to try and figure out what something meant or what the future meant. The Chaldeans, they were a tribe, the ruling tribe of Babylon, and they claimed to also be wise men. And then the soothsayers, the word there in the original literally means to cut apart or cut asunder. The soothsayers were the ones who would take the kidneys of the sheep and they would cut it in half and they'd open it up and they'd look at various blood vessels and they'd say, all right, this is what this means. So they would look to animals to foretell the future. And they had the, sort of the tea leaves in the cup. You've heard that, that try and tell it. So they would actually divide and cut things to try and foretell the future. He brings in all of his wise men. This time, though, the amazing thing is he tells them the dream. And they're still powerless to tell him what he means. It's as if God kind of closed their mind. You'd think they could have come up with something, right? But no, they couldn't even come up with anything when the king told them the dream. 
Looking at the note under there, it says, again, the wise one of Babylon failed to help the king. Even though the time of the first dream, recording Daniel chapter 2, they boasted that if the king would tell them the dream, they could make known its interpretation. Now, after being told the dream, they still could not come up with the meaning of the dream. Daniel chapter 2, verse 10, this is after, Daniel, uh, after Nebuchadnezzar received his first dream. It says, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar said? He said, not only tell me the meaning of the dream, what did he want them to tell him? The dream dream itself. So the wise man, the Chaldeans said, there's not a man on earth that can tell you this. Therefore there is no king, nor lord, nor ruler who has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no man who can tell the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh, while in walks Daniel. Daniel is able to tell the king his dream as well as his meaning because God revealed the same thing to Daniel that very next night. All right, verse 8. But at last, again, Daniel came before me. So first he calls for the wise men. They can't help, and then Daniel comes. There's a reason for that. Why did God allow the wise men to go in first? So that the king could see the foolishness of his so-called wise men, of his counselors. They didn't really know. Then Daniel comes in. And Daniel is able to explain the meaning. Verse 8 again, it says, But at last Daniel came in before me. His name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him the spirit of the holy God is. And I told the dream before him, saying. So now he's going to tell us what the dream is. Notice the name that's mentioned, Belteshazzar. Now Belteshazzar is different than Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to read about uh, about him in Daniel chapter 5. But Belteshazzar was the name given to Daniel when he came to Babylon. Daniel and his three friends, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they all entered into the Babylonian court to be trained in the royal college for key positions in the Babylonian empire. Perhaps if they proved themselves faithful and loyal to the king, he would send them back to the country from which they came and they would rule in that country on behalf of the king. So he wanted to indoctrinate them in the way of the Chaldeans, in the way of the Babylonians. And one of the things he did was change their name. And he connected the new name that he gave them to one of his gods. And so Belteshazzar was a name given to Daniel, connected with one of the Babylonian gods. Now all the other people probably referred to Daniel as Belteshazzar, but Daniel, when writing, never refers to himself as Belteshazzar. He always refers to himself as Daniel. He held to his original true Hebrew name. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar knew that the spirit of the true God guided Daniel and that neither he nor his three friends would compromise truth to secure higher positions or even preserve their lives, as you saw in Daniel 3. The king could have confidence in Daniel's interpretation as trustworthy and true. Unlike the covetous wise men who were always looking for an opportunity for self-exaltation, he could trust Daniel in the interpretation. Verse 9. Belteshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar, still talking to Daniel, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the vision of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. So Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were given Babylonian names, as we had mentioned, during their time of training to Nebuchadnezzar. uh, He gave the name Daniel, Belteshazzar, and Nebuchadnezzar gave Daniel's name, Belteshazzar, the son of the heathen god Baal. But Daniel always refers to himself by his Hebrew name. Interestingly, the king expressed confidence in Daniel's superior power and understanding even before telling Daniel the dream. The calm, peaceful attitude manifest in the life of Daniel was recognized by Nebuchadnezzar as being a manifestation of the spirit of the holy God. So just by the way that Daniel interacted with the king, the way Daniel conducted his business. Now remember, this is about 35 years after Daniel and his friends had been in Babylon. So they had been there a long time. Uh, They had proven themselves to be trustworthy. And by beholding, by witnessing what Daniel was doing, Nebuchadnezzar recognized that the spirit of the holy God is in him. What is the example? What is, what, is the, what is the life that we live that other people look at? Do they, can they say of Daniel, the Holy Spirit is with him, the Holy Spirit is with her? I hope so. That needs to be our testimony, right? Just like Daniel in this foreign land. Now the titles used by the king when referring to Daniel as the chief of the magicians is synonymous with the title used in Daniel chapter 2 verse 48 where Daniel is referred to as the chief administrator over all of the wise men. It's the same thing a position that he was promoted to after revealing the king's first dream 
and its interpretation in Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, this is after the dream is explained in Daniel 2. It says, Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief administrator over all of the wise men of Babylon. But Daniel didn't forget about his three friends. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he sets Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. What does it mean to sit in the gate of the king? He was one of the main counselors to the king. So he and the king had a good relationship during those 35 years. He trusted Daniel. Verse 10. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. Thank you. 100 degrees out there. Thank you, Carlos. So what does he see? He sees a tree that has great height. And not only does this tree have great height, it's placed in the midst of the earth. And we're going to touch on those two things in just a minute. Now in the Bible, a tree is often used as a symbol of people and nations. The righteous are called trees of righteousness who are said to flourish like the palm tree and to grow like the cedar of Lebanon in Psalm 92 verse 12. The prophet Ezekiel likened the Assyrians to a mighty cedar tree in Ezekiel 31 verse 3 to 6. And Christ is represent or represents the nation of Israel as a fig tree in Luke chapter 13, 6 through 9. And the apostle Paul refers to Israel as an olive tree in Romans chapter 11. So the idea of a tree representing a people or a nation was not foreign, not to the Hebrews. And it's not foreign, it wasn't even foreign, I think, to some degree to Nebuchadnezzar because that's why the dream troubled him. He realized there was something significant about this dream. It represented something important. Psalm 1 verse 3, talking about trees representing people or the people of God, it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does, it shall prosper. Talking of the believer, talking of those who put their faith and trust in God. And in Luke chapter 13, verse 6 to 9, Jesus spoke another parable. This is referring to the Jewish people. And he also spoke a parable saying, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came to seek fruit on it, but he found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree. I have found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and he said, Sir, let it alone for one also until I dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bear fruit, well. But if not, after that you might cut it down. Now, of course, this parable that Jesus told of the fig tree represents the nation of Israel. It refers to the time of probation that God had given them, and in particular sense, the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of John the Baptist, in calling Israel to repentance to that time period when their probation as a nation would end, which occurred in 34 AD at the stoning of Stephen. So the fig tree here represents Israel, represents the people of God. And there is another reference, not in your notes, but another reference to a tree that I thought was very interesting. You find this in Luke 23. Now the story behind this is, this is Jesus making his way to the cross. He's bearing his cross. Luke 23 verse 27 says, and a great multitude of people followed him. And women also mourning and lamenting him. This is when Jesus is carrying his cross. There are women weeping because of the suffering that is coming upon him. Verse 28, but Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. And so Jesus, don't cry because of what they, the Romans, are doing to me, but rather weep for yourselves. Then he says this, verse 31, for if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Now Jesus, speaking of the Romans, he says, if they do these things in the green tree, what will happen when the tree is dry? What did Jesus mean when he said the green tree and the dry tree or the green wood and the dry wood? Well, during that time when Jesus was crucified, he had ministered for three and a half years. Probation for the Jewish nation was going to continue another three and a half years until the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD. So even though the Romans were crucifying Jesus, probationary time was still open to the Jews they were still a green tree. But when their probationary time ended in 34 AD at the stoning of Stephen, then they went from being a green tree to being a dry tree. 
And Jesus said, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. For if the Romans do this during our probationary time period as a nation for the Jews, what will they do when your probation is closed? Well, history tells us what they did. In 70 AD, the Romans came and surrounded Jerusalem. And at the end of that slaughter, it says, the blood of the Jews ran down the temple stairs like water. It was a horrific scene. And Jesus was speaking of that calamity that was yet to come. So, what do we take from that? Are we living in the green tree today, or are we living in the dry tree? Has probation closed for the world today, or is probation still open? Can people still be saved? Yes. But according to Revelation chapter 7, the Bible speaks of four angels holding the four corners of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Once the sealing work is finished and those four angels let go the four winds of strife, the earth will be plunged into a time of trouble that will be worse than the world has ever seen. Probation will end for planet earth. Michael stands up, Daniel chapter 12, and there is a great time of trouble. The seven last plagues are poured out. But those who have the seal of God, when that time comes, they will be shielded. They will be protected by God himself. They will be delivered. So probation is not yet closed. Thus the urgency of the message to tell as many people as possible while we have time. But the time will come when probation will close. We'll have the seal of God. All right, moving on then with our story, verse 11, talking about this tree that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached up into heaven. And it says it could be seen to the ends of the earth. That's referring to the Babylonian Empire. It's referring to Nebuchadnezzar, the power and splendor of Babylon. The ancient city of Babylon was the center of the then known world. And the reign of Nebuchadnezzar was thus symbolized by a tree in the midst of the earth that had great height whose branches stretched out in all various directions. Jeremiah spoke of this. Now remember Jeremiah, he was a contemporary of Daniel. Uh, he was in Jerusalem when Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel had read the writings of Jeremiah. He had also read the writings of Isaiah. So this is what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah chapter 5, Jer Jeremiah 27 verse 5 and 6 is actually the Lord speaking through Jeremiah. I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are on the ground. By my great power and by my outstretched arm, I have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field, which I also have given to serve him. So here, Jeremiah prophesied that God would turn power over to Nebuchadnezzar. He calls him my servant. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar is converted at the end. Verse 12, speaking of the great tree, it says its leaves were lovely. Its fruit was abundant, and it was used for food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Notice a few things that's given as, as it relates to the tree. First of all, it was a lovely tree, big tree. Its fruit was abundant. There was enough fruit to feed everyone. It talks about the beasts of the field finding shade, the birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches. Everyone was fed from the tree. Now, does the Bible speak of another tree that is beautiful, that's leaves are for the healing of the nations, that bears 12 different kinds of fruit, and that people come and eat of the tree? What is the name of that tree? It's called the tree of life. And where is the tree of life? It's in heaven. So you have the tree of life in heaven depicting God's kingdom and God sustaining his people and you have the tree described here in uh, Daniel chapter 4 representing Babylon it is a limited provision that Babylon provides for the world it's limited because the tree eventually gets cut down the tree of life never gets cut down it continues to provide fruit and to be a blessing to others so you have two systems two parallels that are established that we find in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. You have Babylon on the one hand and you have the New Jerusalem on the other. You have a counterfeit system of religion as it refers to Babylon and you have the true religion as it refers to Jerusalem and in particular the New Jerusalem. You have pagan sacrifices in Babylon, you have the true sacrifice in Jerusalem. So you have these two parallels. There is a tree in Babylon, there is a tree in the New Jerusalem. Once again, parallels to be found between these two books. Okay, this tree reached up into heaven. Its leaves were fair. Its fruit was abundant. It was food for all. 
The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in its branches. The external glory and splendor of Babylon was great. Nebuchadnezzar ruled his empire in such a way that the prosperity and the magnificence of the kingdom were unmatched by any other. Babylon was rightfully described as the head of gold in the image recorded in Daniel chapter 2. All right, Daniel chapter 2, verse 36, speaking of Babylon, this is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. This is not the dream of Daniel 4. This is the dream of the image of Daniel 2. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, notice the language here, the beasts of the field, the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So there's a connection between Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon in Daniel chapter 2. It talks about the beasts of the field. It talks about the birds of the air. In Daniel chapter 4, you have a tree that provides for the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. There is a clear connection that this tree in Daniel 4 represents Babylon, represents Nebuchadnezzar. Even Nebuchadnezzar, I think, got that connection even before Daniel explained it. That's why he was so troubled by this dream. He realized this tree represented him, represented the Babylonian Empire. Okay, verse 13. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. So he sees the tree, it's flourishing, and he sees a watcher coming from heaven. It's interesting that it uses the word watcher. A watcher is one who observes. A watcher is one that records. Are our actions, our thoughts, our words, our influence be recorded, being recorded even today? Yes. Where are our words and actions and thoughts being recorded? In the books of heaven, right? There are angels that witness things happening here on the earth, and there is there is a point that God has given to all mankind. His grace, his mercy extends grace to everyone, but there is a point where judgment comes. And for Nebuchadnezzar, the time was coming for judgment to come upon him. And the holy watcher comes down with his testimony that the time has come. As the king gazed upon this lofty tree, he beheld a divine messenger, or the holy one that came down from heaven. God knows the thoughts of every individual. Nothing can be hidden from his sight. For he will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, for the believer of Christ, do we need to fear the judgment? Not if our sins are forgiven, right? They are blotted out. They are cleansed. If we are inviting Jesus to come into our hearts and lives every day, if we are opening the mind's door to the words of Christ, to the word of God, if we are meditating upon God's word, or if we are thinking about the life of Christ, if we are thinking about the words of Jesus, we will be sealed with the seal of the living God. We have nothing to fear in the judgment. But if we have rejected the gospel, if we are not walking in the light that God has given us, if we are turning away from known duty, there is a warning in the story. There is a day of reckoning. There is a day of judgment that is to come. There is a holy watcher that is observing and keeping accounts, right? And the day of reckoning is coming. But if we are Christ, we have nothing to fear for the, God, for the judgment for we have been clothed in Christ's robe of righteousness. Okay, verse 14. And he cried with a loud voice. He cried aloud and said, Thus chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit, let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. The tree was a symbol not only of Nebuchadnezzar but also of the kingdom of Babylon. The glory and the wealth and the power obtained by the kingdom of Babylon was soon to pass to another kingdom, that of the Medo-Persian Empire, symbolized by the chest and arms of silver in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar recorded in Daniel chapter 2. To the, to the degree that Babylon persecuted the nations around her, she was oppressed and crushed by the kingdom that conquered her. In one night, the city of Babylon fell. Her king was killed, and another took her glory and her wealth. In the book of Revelation, Babylon is symbolic of apostate Christianity. In the last days, as church and state unite to enforce a worship that contradicts God's commandments and persecutes those who refuse to submit to her authority, probationary time for symbolic Babylon will end, and judgment will quickly follow. Now, we have not reached that final moment where Worldwide probation is closed. But there is a closing of probation that occurs on various institutions 
and various groups or nations before universal probation closes. Why do we say that? Revelation chapter 14 verse 8. This is part of the three angels' messages. This is the second angel's message. The angel says, and another angel followed saying, Babylon is, fallen is, fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now when it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, it's talking about her probationary time has already come and gone. In other words, God can't for that institution use that church, that religious institution, he can use individuals and he can call people to come out. As we find out a little later in our, in our verse, we're going to look at. So Babylon represents this coalition of church and state in the last days. And the message is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. How many times did Babylon fall? She is fallen, she is, she falls twice. Now why does Babylon fall twice? We're going to get to that. Take a look at this. Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. In Bible prophecy, what does a woman represent? A church. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a cup full of the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication, and on her forehead is the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. So here you have a description of symbolic Babylon. It begins by describing a woman seated upon a scarlet-colored beast. In Bible prophecy, what does a beast represent? A political power, right? A kingdom, political power. A woman, in Bible prophecy, represents a church. Revelation chapter 12 describes the true church, a pure woman standing upon the moon, clothed with the sun with the crown of 12 stars. Revelation 17 describes this woman with gold and silver, dressed in scarlet, she's sitting on this beast. It is a persecuting power. You have church and state uniting. And of course, on her forehead is written the name Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So you have the mother, you also have the daughters. So the mother church, we know from Bible prophecy, has been, decide, has been uh, described many times representing the medieval church or the papal church during the 1260 years of papal supremacy. The daughter churches would be those Protestant churches that came out from Catholicism during the great Protestant Reformation in the 1500s and beyond, and yet they still clung to, they held on to some of the traditions of the mother church. In other words, they didn't come all the way out of the pagan traditions that had crept in to the mother church. So you have the fall of the mother in 1798. Berthier, Napoleon's general, marched into Rome, proclaimed the political rule of the papacy at an end, and the papal power received its deadly wound, as was prophesied, although that deadly wound would be healed. That's the mother. But there is a second fall, and the fall is of those Protestant churches that have clung to the traditions, the man-made traditions, the beliefs that are not in the Bible, and we can still find many of those traditions in many Protestant churches today. There is a special message, a special call that is coming from God. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. God is wanting to call his faithful people to come out of religious confusion so they can make their stand on Bible truth. That's why we have Revelation chapter 18, God's last call to those who are still in Babylon. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you receive her sins or share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities, rendered to her just as she has rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. In the measure that she has glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow. Remember the woman sitting upon the scarlet color beast. And I will see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she should be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. So here you have the fourth angel, Revelation 18 with the message similar to that of the second angel. The difference between the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and the fourth angel is that the angel in Revelation 18, the fourth angel, proclaims the message with a loud voice. 
Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The second angel just announces that Babylon is fallen. I don't know if you noticed that before. The first angel, Revelation chapter 14, has a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast in his image, that's the third angel. That has a loud voice. So the first angel, the third angel has a loud voice. The second angel simply announces that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The difference, though, between the second angel and the fourth angel in Revelation 18 is that this angel proclaims with a loud voice, and when the message is given boldly, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Then a voice is heard from heaven. Whose voice is that? That's the voice of Jesus. Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. They will hear my voice. They will come. There will be one fold and one shepherd. So when the church does its work in proclaiming God's gospel truth, the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages, then Jesus is able to call his people to come out of religious confusion. These are people that love the Lord. They're living up to all the light that they have. But they've never understood these prophetic truths. They've asked about Revelation, and their pastors say, don't worry about the book. It's a sealed book. Or they've asked, why is it that we worship on the first day instead of the seventh day? Doesn't the Bible say, remember the Sabbath? I don't worry about that. But the Holy Spirit has spoken to their heart, and they've heard truth, and they've made a decision. They've responded to the gospel truth. They have come out of Babylon. So the first fall is the mother church. The second fall is the daughter churches, those Protestant churches that are clinging to the traditions of the mother church. Babylon is fallen. All right, back to the dream. Verse 15. Nevertheless, it says, leave the stump and the root in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the grass on the earth. Now, when the order was given to cut down the tree, it was commanded that the stump be left in the earth, bound with a band of iron and a band of brass. The symbols of iron and brass are used in the Bible to represent a spirit of pride and rebellion, characteristics that well reflected Nebuchadnezzar before his conversion. It's also interesting to note that the kingdom of Greece in Daniel chapter 2 was symbolized by brass and the kingdom of Rome by iron. So if the tree represents Babylon, Babylon was cut down, but there was something from Babylon that remained in the brass and the iron. The pagan traditions and the teachings that was practiced in Babylon found their way into Persia, Medo-Persia, found their way into Greece, and actually went into Rome and found its way into the papal power. You can trace some of the traditions all the way back to Babylon, these false doctrines that crept into the Christian church. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 4. It says, because I knew that you were obstinate and your neck was of iron sinew and your brow of bronze. Talking about stubbornness. Jeremiah 6 verse 28. They're all stubborn rebels walking as slanders. They are bronze and iron. They're all corrupted. So it's describing the condition that we see here in Babylon. Verse 16. It says, let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of the beast and let seven times pass over him. So now suddenly the tree goes from being a tree to being a hymn. So now it's really clear who this hymn, who this tree is. That transition in figurative from the tree to a man is now made in the verse. The term heart here is used to indicate nature or mind. The king would take upon himself the nature of a beast. The seven times was to be understood as seven years. One time is equivalent to one year. The Greek Old Testament of Daniel chapter 4 translates times as years, and the Jewish historian Josephus wrote that Nebuchadnezzar's insanity lasted for seven years. So one of those times represents a year. Verse 17. This decision is the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living might know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to him whom every will and sets over it the lowest of men. So notice it says this decision, this decree is by the watchers. Now who are the watchers? These are these angelic beings in heaven that are witnessing the events taking place on earth. They are working with God. They're watching. They're recording. Now it has been suggested that the watchers described here in Daniel are, or the holy ones are the same group that Revelation speaks of in Revelation chapter 4 as the 24 elders. Now, the 24 elders would be the ones that make up that heavenly council. In uh, Revelation chapter 4, you have a description of God's throne room. 
It begins by describing God seated upon the throne. There is a rainbow about the throne. It talks about seven burning lamps of fire that are before the throne and then talks about the 24 elders that surround the throne. These 24 elders are wearing crowns and they have robes and they're witnessing the events that are taking place here on the earth. In chapter 5 in Revelation, you have the 24 elders in heaven before Jesus appears. Jesus appears in Revelation chapter 5 as a lamb as it had been slain. So chapter 5 describes Jesus as he ascended to heaven after the resurrection. But the 24 elders were already in heaven waiting for Jesus to come. And they are witnessing things that are taking place on earth. So who are these 24 elders? Well, we do know that there is a group that Job refers to as the sons of God. Job chapter 1 verse 6, it's also mentioned I think later in that same chapter. It says, Job 1 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came amongst them. So there is this gathering, not on the earth, because then God asked Satan, where did you come from? And Satan said, oh, from walking up and down on the earth. So this gathering, this meeting didn't take place in the earth. It must have taken place somewhere else. But there are the sons of God, these representatives of these unfallen worlds. They're all present. Satan comes representing the earth. God said, where did you come from? He said, oh, I came from the earth. Then God says, have you considered my servant Job? In other words, what God is saying to Satan is, you think the earth is all yours, but there is somebody in your kingdom that really belongs in my kingdom. His name is Job. Oh, and Satan gets so upset. <laughs> and you know how the story plays out, where God allows Job to be tested, and Satan does his best, and Job remains faithful to God. Amen. Faithful to God. It's a powerful story. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 23, also talks about these elders or these sons of God. Isaiah 24, 23, this is an interesting verse. It says, The moon shall be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his elders gloriously. So there we have a reference to the elders all the way back in Isaiah 24. So some suggest, and I think there's value in that, that these holy watchers is the same group as the 24 elders that you read about in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, which says, Around the throne were 24 elders, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed with white robes, that had crowns of gold on their heads. So this is the involvement of these angelic beings witnessing the events taking place on earth. And there is a judgment that is coming from heaven. Verse 18, this is the dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't even ask Daniel if he can explain the dream. He just simply states, because the spirit of the holy God is in you, tell me the dream. Declare the dream and its interpretation. Once more, Nebuchadnezzar is forced to acknowledge the supremacy of the Hebrew God, over that of his Babylonian gods. Once again, God is proven true, the most high God in ruling in the affairs taking place here on the earth. Okay, we're going to pause our study right here in this verse, in chapter 4, and we pick it up where we left off next week. What do we see so far in our study? Nebuchadnezzar the king, he has a dream. In this dream, he sees a giant tree. The tree provides nourishment for the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, for all of the people. But then a holy watcher comes down from heaven. He says, cut down the tree, put a band of iron and brass on the stump of the tree, let seven times or seven years pass over it. And then it talks about some type of restoration, which we're going to talk about later on in our study. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story that we have recorded for us in Daniel chapter 4. Lord, we recognize that you love us and you've given each of us an opportunity to hear, you, hear your word and respond and repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. We can see how you did this even for this pagan king many, many years ago. Help us to learn the lessons so that we can be found faithful with the seal of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a short break and then we'll continue with our worship service.